When my daughter was just 12 months old, we went on a trip to Hawaii. When we were first sitting in the airport waiting to check in for our tickets, some random guys started commenting on how beautiful my daughter was. That wasn't exactly unusual, people consistently told us Anna was the cutest baby they'd ever seen, so I politely accepted the compliment and thanked the guy for his comments. But he didn't stop there. The guy kept getting closer and closer to her, asking me stuff like, how old is she? When is her birthday? What her favorite things are? Where we're headed? I started to feel slightly uncomfortable but kept up the polite pretense because my husband would be back any second. Then the final straw was having the guy actually reach out and attempt to actually physically touch our daughter. I was like, hey, 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 back off, mister. Then my husband came back and the man stepped away pretty quick. We then told airport security about the guy, but he'd apparently made himself scarce since the mood turned sour. Anyway, a few minutes later we arrived at our gate, only to see the exact same handsy guy waiting for us apparently getting on the exact same flight. Airport security then caught up with the guy, but all they seemed to do was ask him not to hassle us again. After that, we got on the plane, only for the guy to position himself in a seat where all he had to do was look over his shoulder and he could see me and my daughter. Then, when my husband got up to use the bathroom, the guy ended up turning around and looking me in the eyes before saying in this, like, childlike baby talk voice, Guess who's found out where you're going? We made a huge deal out of this, and the flight attendants took our side, moving the guy to another seat and telling him not to move. Upon landing, there were people waiting for him that he was forced to go with, security or airport staff, I don't know, but we didn't see him again. I can't say for certain what the guy had in mind for me and my daughter, whether he just liked harassing us or if he had something more sinister in mind but I know for a fact that if it wasn't for my husband or for those flight attendants, things probably would have been way worse. That was also the day I realized that flight attendants aren't just servers in the sky. They go through a ton of training for how to handle different situations, one of which oftentimes is human trafficking, which they take very seriously. If you are ever in danger or you feel you're in danger while flying, speak to a flight attendant immediately. They can relay messages through the pilots and ATC and have police waiting to greet you right at the gate. This happened nine years ago. I just ended a four-year relationship and moved into an old building in downtown Paris. I had to start all over again from scratch. I did the mistake to let my ex-girlfriend keep a lot of my furniture, kitchen cutlery, pans, coffee machine, etc. At the time, I worked as a waiter so I could only afford a one-room apartment from a council estate building. It was old and barely clean, but at least I had a roof. The first two weeks, nothing happened, but quickly I began to hear someone talk at night. It was mumblings. They basically said, Go and die already, already, already. When I looked through the door, I saw a scrawny shirtless guy smiling and scratching the door with his finger. That became a thing. Every two or three nights he came and threatened me through the door or sang songs with a childish voice. I might have opened the door and asked him what in God's name he wanted, but I was afraid he had a knife or something and I couldn't see his hands while looking through the door. What stunned me is that he acted totally normal when I stumbled upon him during the day and denied being the one who did that at night. I even got mad at him, but he seemed to genuinely not understand what I was talking about. One day I came home with a girl that I had met at the bar that I was working at. For some reason she left during the night and I went back to sleep. The mumbling started again, only this time it felt really close. I opened my eyes only to witness the scrawny neighbor headbutting the wall and singing what sounded like a mix between religious chants and a lullaby in slow motion. I was honestly paralyzed by fear. I tried to communicate with him, but he was just grinning and ended up exiting my apartment by himself. I decided to call the police that very night. They took him alright, and he went straight to the psych ward. 
Actually, this guy had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and I guess had been in and out of the psychiatric hospital before. He wasn't supposed to live at his place anymore. He just ran from the hospital two months ago and they only reported it, but there wasn't much of an investigation from the police. He initially got sent into the psych ward after bashing a shovel onto a postman's head, putting him in an actual coma. And he did it, for absolutely no reason. I never saw him again, and I moved out two years after that. I grew up in a small beach town on the east coast. It had that cliche suburbia vibe, complete with book clubs and block parties. My sister and I were close friends with our neighbors as well, as they had a daughter, Kristen, who was around our age. A lot of times we spent playing together in our shared yards at the beach down the street and our nearby park. It had been one summer day that my mom and Kristen's mom decided to take us to this particular park, and as per usual, as soon as we arrived, Kristen, my sister, and I raced to the swing set to claim our seats. Our moms had followed leisurely behind us, looking ahead to see if they could snag a spot in the shade. Once they picked a picnic table, they sat down and set up. They were chatting and got some snacks ready for us, occasionally glancing over to make sure we hadn't fallen off the swings. The afternoon was going well. Everyone was having fun and enjoying the weather when Kristen's mom pointed across to where we were playing. There, instead of just three kids swinging, there were four. Seems like the girls made a friend. She smiled at my mom as they looked at the other girl who had just joined us. An older woman, possibly her mother, was standing off to the side as well. My mom nodded, thinking nothing of it. It was completely normal for kids to make friends at the park, and especially in an area so friendly. Besides, she found it likely that the older woman was with her and would be able to help if anything was happening. They proceeded to talk for a little bit longer before my mom thought to look over again to check up on us. When she glanced over to the swings, she saw Kristen, she saw my sister, but she no longer saw me. She stared for one more second as it sunk in, and she realized the older woman was also not there. Panic washed over her and she immediately alerted Kristen's mom. They rushed over, hoping I was just hiding behind the slide. My mom's eyes scanned over the playground, frantically trying to help me. She recalls Kristen's mom taking the other two girls by the hand, attempting to ask them what had just happened. But before either of them were able to offer any information, her eyes locked on me. The older woman had taken me by the hand and was leading me off of the playground, out of the gate, and into the parking lot. My mom began to run after her, not explaining a word, just yelling for her to stop. The woman did not pause, did not even turn around to acknowledge my mom's screams until she was close enough to reach out and grab my one free hand. My mom immediately began to curse and question what in God's name she was doing with me. The older woman began to explain how this was a misunderstanding, that she was only just walking me to the baseball field that was right across the street. Of course... This answer was completely unacceptable, and my mom was making this clear as Kristen's mom was quickly behind catching up, coming to aid in whatever way she could. It appeared that when the older woman noticed Kristen's mom was there as backup, she let go of my hand and began to offer some semblance of an apology before hurrying to her car and quickly pulling away. And it was not until after she had already gotten down the street that my mom understood two suspicious details, which included... The direction the older woman was walking me was towards her parked car and not at all towards the baseball field. And two, the older woman did not put a child in the car before she left, meaning she came to a playground of kids by herself. I often ask my mom why she didn't call the police at this moment and honestly, she doesn't have a good answer. She tells me that it was just shock and I'm sure part of it was, but... I also think that it could have partially been due to embarrassment. However, I hope it's not that at all. There's no way she could have expected this to happen, and she may have very well saved my life right at that moment, and I try to make it as clear to her as I can. While I'm into my 20s now, and this happened when I was like a toddler, I still think about it from time to time. At least, this recounted version my mom tells and it's a terrifyingly scary idea to think that she wouldn't have seen me in time, 
and that I could have possibly had a completely different path in life. So the encounter took place a few years ago. I was living in a super huge apartment block and quite a terrible one at that. One late afternoon I was just chilling with my then girlfriend when I suddenly heard faint scratching noises outside the door. Definitely weird but I dismissed it, thinking it's probably some neighborhood kiddos scratching walls with a key or some other stupid kid stuff sometimes that they do. A moment passed and the noise didn't disappear. Quite the opposite, it actually got louder. At this point I started realizing what the sound was. It was the sound of a metal object scratching on my door's lock. I immediately get startled and went to look via the peephole. The longer corridor was half dark and right there in front of my door there was a man. I couldn't see his face too clearly but I was 100% sure that I didn't know him. He was tinkering with the lock in some way but with the people's limited field of view, I couldn't see what exactly he's doing. I made sure all the locks are, well, locked and backed off as it fell silent. Just as I was about to return to the living room, the door handle slowly moved down, pressed from the other side, and just as slowly returned to its initial position. I freaked out. I hurried to the kitchen, grabbed the biggest knife I had, and squatted next to the door. It was locked, but if he'd managed to pick it, well, there I was, frightened and armed. For a moment, it fell silent again. Then the lever slowly went down and up again. More scratching, and the lever moved again. Then, silence again. And then, I heard a whisper. Let me in. My heart skipped a beat. Or a dozen of them, probably. Let me in. Let me in. If he was screaming, it would be just as frightening, but he wasn't. He was whispering to my door, repeatedly, let me in. I think I unfroze for a second because I grabbed my phone and called the security. The apartment block had the security, but they were stationed in a small booth outside of the block itself, which was huge, and I lived on the 8th floor, so it was a really long way to get there from their place especially given that they were lazy idiots who usually just watch TV and smoke so much that there was a heavy fog inside of the booth. Still, I gave them a panic call, quickly explaining the situation. Sure enough, the guard laughed it off, saying the stranger is probably just some drunk neighbor. He told me that the other guard is on patrol and that he'll call him and tell him to come to my door. I have no idea why I didn't call the police, but I was probably just too frightened to think straight. The block was in the middle of nowhere, so the nearest police station was quite far away anyways. My girlfriend just kept observing, probably some kind of a stress reaction too. Seconds felt like hours, and after some time, it fell silent, this time for good. Fifteen minutes later or so, the freaking security guy finally knocked on my door long after the guy was gone. Good job, man, seriously. Took your sweet time, thank you very much. He said that they would close the gate and check the camera footage, but he didn't look too tense, so I don't know if they actually did anything. To this day, I have no idea what happened. Maybe it was some drunk neighbor who left the elevator one floor too early or too late and thought his wife locked him out. Maybe he actually was some psycho or a, a junkie trying to purposely access my door. I'll never know, and I guess I prefer it this way. It was late summer and I was coming home from hanging out at the beach with my best friend Maya. It was her 17th birthday party. When I got off the subway at my stop, I looked at the bus arrival screen. The bus I would normally take home was arriving in about an hour. Being a tired 14-year-old girl, I decided to take an alternative bus route home. This was a decision I would later regret. When I got off the bus at the stop, I have about a 10-minute walk to my building. My area at night is pretty quiet, not many cars on the streets. As I'm walking up the street, I hear the sound of an engine nearby. I look over my left shoulder and see a white panel van. I know, right? How typical. It's rolling up the street. I try to think nothing of it, but 
when I turn onto my street, the van does too. Now I'm unsettled and start walking faster. The van is driving slowly and it never passes me. When I turn up the long driveway to my building, the van once again turns too, and now I start to feel scared. The driveway to my building has an ice rink on the side of it with bright lights, so I walk beside the rink under the bright lights. There are small houses on the other side of this driveway. The van catches up to me and stops. So I think maybe this person is lost and just trying to ask for directions. I was trying to find some way to rationalize this. I stop. I stay about four feet from the van just in case. I look in the van window to see an older man, starting to bald with black hair and a white t-shirt. I ask if they're lost and they don't respond. Instead, they try to get me into the van. I say no and start walking, but the van continues to drive slowly, following me. When a red car begins to drive down the driveway, the van drives all the way to the end of the driveway and waits for the red car to turn out before reversing to be beside me again. The man is still trying to get me into the van. I want to make a mad dash to my building, but I'm worried that he'll see where I live, so I keep walking. When another car comes down the driveway, the van does what it did before and drive to the end and wait for the car to leave. But this time there is a car dropping someone off at the townhouses. The cabbie is closing his trunk when he sees me. Are you okay? He asks. I tell him how the van had been following me and every time a car comes, the van drives to the end and waits for it to leave before following me again. The cabbie tells me that He'll get in his car to drive to the end of the driveway and sit there for a bit so I have enough time to run to my building. I tell him okay and thank you. The van is back in line with me again, so the cabbie gets in his cab and drives up the driveway and the van follows. I look and see the two vehicles sitting there. I ran up the rest of the driveway into my building's lobby and my heart is racing. When I get to my apartment, I'm still freaked out. I go into my room and call the cops. While I'm on the phone with the cops, I look out of my bedroom window and see the van. It's slowly driving around my building looking for me. Now, I'm fully panicking. The cops send officers to sweep the area, but they don't find him. Two officers came to my apartment and they get a statement from me. About a week after this happened, the officers come back to my apartment. They show me a photo of the man from the van that they were able to get from the security camera on the side of my building. I told them the man in the photo was the one that followed me. They told me that they were aware of this man and that he was already on an offender list. I'm a single male, 33 years old, who lives alone in Denver. My apartment complex is not what you would call a nice building. I'm on a road close to Colfax Avenue, which, if you're familiar with the geography of this area, is not the safest boulevard in town. I'm a few streets away from it, but close enough that I wouldn't consider this an up-and-coming neighborhood. This evening, I was watching Netflix on my couch. My two cats were cuddled up against me as I lay under a comforter. The night before, I was watching a horror movie that was scary enough to leave me in an unsettled mood, making it hard to sleep. So this night I decided to watch a stand-up special instead, keep it light so I wouldn't have any trouble getting some shut-eye. I have classes earlier the next morning, so I was surprised when I made the conscious decision to turn on a second stand-up special and let myself fall asleep on the couch. I was just so comfy where I lay and didn't want to move, not even to turn off the several lights on throughout the apartment. I remember dozing off at around 11 o'clock. It was effortless, which meant I was really snug under the covers with my cats flanking me on either end, creating a tucked-in feeling. I fell into a dream wherein I was on an impromptu date with this guy, whom I didn't recognize, at a Blockbuster video store. He bought me blue and yellow underwear, you know, like a Blockbuster would sell in Dreamland, insinuating that I would take the hint of his intentions. He was also desperate for a job, so when we got to the counter... He was given an off-the-cuff interview that didn't go well. And all of a sudden I'm not sleeping anymore. I'm woken up by a knock at my door. Then a man's voice saying, Maintenance. I just sat there, sitting bolt upright on my couch. I knew something was off. I looked at my phone, which was by my left hand, and the time was 2.15am. 
I didn't move. The floors in my apartment are old wood and there are many creaky floorboards. I didn't want whoever was knocking to know someone was at home and awake, let alone alert to his presence. My cats got up and ran over to the door as they normally would, but I stayed still and listened. After a few minutes with no answer, the man walked away from the door and down the hallway to the stairs. A moment after that, I heard the back door to the building swing open and closed. I have one window where I had a partial view of that door, so I break my paralysis and ran over to it. I saw an old-looking green SUV sitting in the no-parking zone just in front of the back door. It must have been running the entire time because I didn't hear it start up, and the brake lights were glowing red. Someone, presumably the maintenance man, got in the car and it drove off. I don't know what his intentions were, but no one knocks on someone's door at 2.15am claiming to work for the landlord with good deeds in mind. Had it been a true emergency, wouldn't he have knocked again, used his service key to get in the unit? What did I just avoid here? I can only assume it was an attempted robbery at best or abduction at worst. When I was watching the SUV drive off, I surveyed the other apartment windows. They were all dark. I can see every unit except the two other corner apartments below me from that vantage point. I think because my apartment sticks out from the building and has many windows, that I was targeted because my lights were visibly on and noticeable from the street. However, I don't know how this individual got into the building in the first place as you would need a key to do so. I've never been so legitimately afraid as a single person living alone. I'm grateful I installed a security chain on my door when I moved in. I'm also so grateful that, even in my disoriented state, I had the presence of mind not to move from the couch or make any noise. As I recount the event, I can't stop my eyes from leaking tears, though I wouldn't call it crying. My nerves are definitely shot. I don't think I'll be going back to dreamland anytime soon. I have turned off all the lights save for the lamp by my bed. I usually can't sleep with it on. Tonight, I don't think I could sleep with it off. Last night, I took some melatonin to get to sleep early. I have an American bully who is scared of everything, so I don't think of her as my protector. I feel that I'm her protector, and I'm fine with that. My boyfriend works late, so she usually barks when she hears the garage open. At 10.55, she started going crazy. At first, I told her to go back to bed. I then heard my doorbell going off excessively and knocking. We never use our front door, and not once have we ever entered through our front door. We use the garage. My first thought was my boyfriend's garage opener must have been broken or something, but I had no calls or texts from him. My dog was still going insane. We live in a little gated community, so I don't ever really feel unsafe. I go down and my dog's with me. I can see through the peephole because I'm really short, and I heard someone screaming, help me, and they were still knocking and using the doorbell. I thought my boyfriend was just playing a trick on me. We have one of those hotel-like locks at the top of the door so you can open it like two inches without really opening it. I unlocked the deadbolt and doorknob and opened it and a man was saying, help me, and then started jerking the knob. I screamed, what do you need help with? He wouldn't speak, he just kept jerking the doorknob while my dog is sounding the meanest I'd ever heard. I slammed the door with all my strength and lock it back up. I'm yelling that I'm going to call the cops. While on the phone, he's still ringing the doorbell and beating on the door, and 911 could even hear it. I felt bad because I wasn't sure if they were hurt, but why wouldn't they say something when the door was open? Why didn't my dog's bark phase them at all? He stays beating on the door until the cops get there, and when they get there, I see them put an elderly man in the back of their car. I find out that it's my neighbor across the street that I've never met and barely seen. Apparently, he has dementia and got out of his house. I have a feeling of such guilt for calling the police and scaring his wife. I also felt stupid for how scared I was. I watch a lot of true crime shows and my boyfriend has an important job and sometimes isn't home until about 4am, so I immediately thought that someone was watching me and knew that I was home alone. 
I'm not sure if this is the right place to post this, but it was so scary in the moment and now I feel kind of silly and feel like if it was someone trying to hurt me, I did the wrong thing by opening the door a little, even though it was still locked. I just keep telling myself I did the right thing because what was I supposed to do when all I knew was a strange man was at my door acting erratically and trying to get in my house? I feel bad for his wife and that the cops made him take an ambulance to the ER to get checked out. Either way, that was my creepy encounter for 2022, and hopefully for the rest of my life. I'm a 20-year-old female and I moved in my own place in the city about three months ago, and first time living on my own and I'm in the heart of downtown trying to pursue acting. I have two neighbors down the hall, both male, one is maybe around 40 and the other is somewhere around 70 to 80. We'll call the 40 year old 40 and the 70 year old 70 to keep it simple. Okay, these two have been fighting non-stop for the past two weeks. Like 40 is banging on 70's door yelling his name saying stuff like, you stop yelling or open this door and you stop being terrible, all these sorts of names that I can't repeat here. and. 70 will literally make threats like, stop banging my door, I'll kill you and your family, and starts loudly mocking the noise of the knocking. Anyhow, when I first moved here, 40 kept asking if I was single or married. I do have a boyfriend, so obviously I told him that. And he within seconds went from trying to flirt and being kind, to literally just angry and telling me to get my dog to stop licking his shoes or whatever, and just storms off. Fast forward a week and he sees me and asks me again. Again, I tell him I have a boyfriend and he calmly says, Nah, that's okay. I feel you, girl. So I walked off and again a couple of days ago, this time a lot weirder, he says, Hey, you know I was in love with you, right? And I responded saying like, No, I didn't. We barely ever speak. And he asked if I had lost my man yet. I told him no and he asked if I was sleeping around. I said no, and he asked how many people I've been with. I asked him why he was asking personal questions to a stranger, and he insisted that meant that I slept with a lot of people. I didn't want him to think that it was easy to get that, so I simply told him that I'd had two boyfriends, and I only slept with people I was dating. He stormed off and said, that's a lie. And I asked him what led him to believe that I was lying. He turned around and told me that 70 had told him I had been sleeping with him. This was obviously not true, and he said I just didn't want to share the love because he was black, and I told him I just didn't want to share the love with anyone I wasn't dating in general, and he got mad and stormed off yelling, I'll show you how to share the love someday, girl. And later that night he came past my apartment after yelling at 70 and just said my name by my door. I don't know how to interpret it. My mom wants me to request out of my lease and move into a house down the road, my boyfriend wants me to move in with him, and everyone thinks I should leave. I don't know if it's creepy or what, or what he even meant by it, but one of my sisters said it would be good to post on here and get others' views, so here goes. I'd like to add, I don't just go around giving away my name. Everyone in my unit knows me because I work at the grocery store literally down the road. I didn't think the people in this new building would be so different than the people in the last. Back in the summer of 2020, I was 14 and I would spend a lot of time with my cousin. We both loved going on walks and would always walk in the neighborhood near her house. One night I was spending the night over and we decided to go on a walk. It was around 10pm and I'd like to be precise that the roads weren't well lighted so it was very dark. We were used to doing that so we weren't too scared at all. But while we were walking, a white jeep started driving very close to us. The guy who was driving lowered his window and there was another guy with him and they both seemed to be at around 25 years old. The guys were just weirdly staring at us for like two minutes. Then the guy in the passenger seat started asking weird questions like, Aren't you girls scared of the dark? And after asking this, he drove away. Me and my cousin were relieved thinking that this was just a joke, but unfortunately we noticed the jeep's lights in the road and it seemed like they were going back and forth before coming to our level again and this time it was the guy in the passenger seat who talked, 
and he asked if we wanted to ride home, then said we will take care of you while smiling, and it was at this moment my cousin's eyes opened wide, and after that they drove away again. Me and my cousin were petrified that we couldn't even speak. We were still hearing that jeep, so we didn't want to run home because we were afraid that they would follow us. We hid inside a garden behind trees for about ten minutes. The jeep came back, but fortunately they didn't see us. We didn't have our phones because we usually don't take them on walks. When the lights disappeared, we sprinted home. We got there and cried quite a bit. And my cousin told me that she got so scared because she had noticed that there was a knife and some sort of pills in the back seat. I grew up in a quiet suburb outside of Houston. Some people talk about neighborhoods where people don't lock their doors. This wasn't that kind of neighborhood. Situations in Houston notoriously went from 0 to 100 quickly, so while the neighborhood was basically quiet, doors were locked and checked religiously. That being said, 90% of the time the big neighborhood problems would be teens vandalizing or car break-ins. Annoying, but not really terrifying. I worked retail at a clothing store that closed at 9. I worked with a woman I was getting to be friends with who asked if I could give her a ride home. It was a little out of the way, but I didn't mind. Her neighborhood was pretty sketchy. I don't know if it has anything to do with what happened later, but I drove her to her apartment and we sat in the car and chatted until she was ready to head inside. I sat in the car to watch her go inside. Around me, other residents were outside drinking and just shooting the breeze. It was around 10, so it would have been late for my neighborhood to be outside talking at a volume like this on a weeknight, but it was expected at this place, so I didn't think much of it. When she got inside, she blinked the lights a couple of times to let me know she was in safe and I headed for my childhood home. I should note that this was a time before cell phones, so this was kind of a basic routine. I was to call her from my house once I was home and everyone would be confirmed safe. I don't remember the drive home really. I probably blasted tunes and sang along as I usually did and parked in the driveway. The outside lights were on. Mom was good about turning them on for me, so I went inside without fuss. Now, a note about my parents. They weren't really mean drunks, but they were alcoholics. They still functioned okay by day, but it wasn't uncommon for me to arrive upon a scene as I did that night with all the lights on, the TV going, and Mom passed out on the couch. Dad was presumably in the bedroom or passed out in his man cave. From experience, I also knew if I turned off the lights of the TV, Mom would wake up and be grouchy about me waking her up, so I left everything as it was and headed to the bathroom to brush my teeth and wash up for bed. Once in my room, changed for bed, I called my friend to let her know I was home and all was well. One of my more annoying habits is that it's almost impossible for me to end a conversation. I'm incredibly tired and just want to read a book or something, but instead was just rambling at each other about work things or whatever. I had already gotten to bed and turned the lights out. I was just laying in bed in the dark listening to my friend rambling. My room was at the front of the house. It had a weird wall in front of the window, some stylistic mid-century modern thing that didn't make a lot of sense, but did block out some of the light from headlights when cars passed. Ours wasn't a highly trafficked area, but cars driving by in a square pattern of light on the upper part of the wall wasn't an unusual sight. What was unusual, though, were specific beams of light bouncing around the upper part of the wall to the ceiling, and I stared at them for a moment before realizing that they were flashlights. That was highly unusual, but I figured it was just kids. I wasn't the sort of kid that other kids bullied or pranked. We never had our house TP'd, and I couldn't imagine anyone that would want to now that we'd all been graduated. I really needed to sleep because I had college finals the next day and yet flashlights were around the house and it was super weird. I really needed to sleep because I had college finals the next day and yet flashlights around the house was super weird. My friend told me to call the police but for a variety of reasons I'm just not a fan. Besides, carrying flashlights in my front yard isn't a crime, so I couldn't even imagine what the police would do. I see well in the dark, and besides, the lights in the living room were still on, so still on the phone, 
but without turning on any extra lights, I got up and with the intent to check the front door. I really don't remember how long my friend and I were on the phone rambling. It had to be a while for what happened next to have happened. I get to the living room and I hear something in the kitchen. It's this weird metallic slapping sound that makes no sense at all. I tell my friend she continues to caution me to call the police, but for what? Flashlights? Metal sounds? The kitchen lights are also on, so you have to picture it. A barely lit living room with a woman passed out on the couch. The TV is on. The kitchen lights are on, but not the dining room. But for all intents and purposes, this looked like a house where people are awake. Except for my mom, who's very clearly dead to the world. So, I head towards the sound. At the very end of the kitchen, there is a smallish window with metal blinds. The blinds are closed, but they're rattling, making that weird metallic slapping noise, and I think, is the window open? We're not a window opening people. I know some people in the south open their windows on a nice evening, but that's not us. Sometimes windows are open temporarily when mom would pass out while cooking dinner and something burned, but it was always for a very fixed time. It was possible that she left the window open, but unlikely, so I just stood there, staring at it, head cocked like a curious dog. And then I saw the front of a shoe on the sill. I screamed. Actually, just saying that I screamed way understates the noise that I made. I'm a notorious low talker and I assumed that I'd just been saving all that volume for this precise moment. I wailed. I cried. I keened. I became a banshee and threw all my power into my voice in this mighty force. The foot immediately vanished. My mom woke. My friend screamed on the phone with me. From the back of the house, my dad came bounding out with his gun. I got off the phone and called the police. I grabbed another gun and headed outside behind my dad. I'm not a gun person and going outside was super stupid, but the scream to end all screams had apparently done its job as no one was there. Being kind of an expert in criminology due to watching police shows, I told everyone to stay away from the sill so the police could investigate it. I had visions of them taking fingerprints and molding the shoe prints to find the culprit. It was an adorable thought. The police arrived half an hour later, so it's good we weren't actually under attack. In the meantime, my mom started to doubt that I'd seen anything and started to believe that she'd left the window open. But no, the police verified that the window had been pried open, that whomever it was very carefully took all the bric-a-brac that decorated the sill and set it on the ground, as if trying to remain very quiet. At no point before this did I consider what the invader's plan was. Maybe it was shock or lack of imagination or just being tired, but they knew it was a full house and they were sneaking in. These weren't robbers who just wanted to take some electronics for quick cash. They were going to take us by surprise. To do what, though? Thoroughly chilled, I asked when they were going to take fingerprints and the cops basically laughed me off because nothing was stolen. We locked down the windows and I stayed up all night trying not to imagine what exactly those people were going to do to us. About five to six years ago I was working at a gas station and I ran into a girl I recognized from high school. She was with her boyfriend who was a regular in the store. I distinctly remembered him because he wore this really cool looking horned rim glasses. We get to talking and I asked him if he wanted to get together and smoke a bit. He agreed and said that he'd wait for me after he dropped off his girlfriend. So end the shift is around 11pm and he comes and he's outside waiting and tells me that he knows a really cool smoke spot. I follow him in my car to said smoke spot and we end up in a gravel lot surrounded by various RVs and trailers. I didn't think much of it because it seemed pretty safe and out of the way from police. We smoke a bit and afterwards he invited me to his place and since I was pretty baked, I said screw it, why not. A dude leads me to this really dark neighborhood and takes me to a house that he enters from the basement that leads into a nice room. Except for the fact that it had nothing but a bed and a TV. Did I mention that there were plastic sheets around the TV and near the bed? 
The hair stood on the back of my neck like I was in danger, and when he asked if I wanted to sit on the bed, I politely declined and said it was about time for me to go home. He then asked me if I wanted to smoke another one before heading out, and being the young fiend that I was, I said alright, but I also insisted on being outside. He invited me to his car to roll up and smoke. Now, I was already on edge, maybe from the weed, but I'll maintain it was my sixth sense. And when the guy turns the radio on, he turns on some music from the early 1900s. Really couldn't tell you what decade. The type of stuff you hear in serial killer movies and starts going on and on about how it was his favorite music. I asked him if he was going to roll up or not because I was really only there to smoke before I left and he still hadn't started. So he pulls out the wrap and pulls out a knife and the second I saw the handle, I bolted. I'm talking fastest I've ever run back to my car. I locked the doors and turned the ignition on before he could even get out of the car. I screeched my wheels peeling out of the neighborhood. I never spoke to him again. I swear I met a serial killer that night and I just barely managed to get away. What do you guys think? Was I just tripping balls? Hello Mr. X. My name is Chris. The story I want to share with you and the dreamers took place many years ago when I was living in Washington State. It was a hot summer, right after the end of my senior year of high school. We just got some relief due to a couple nights of good heavy rain. Normally, this would have been a welcome change, but this time it really got in the way of a paintball trip my best friend Garth and I had been planning for our post-graduation shenanigans. Garth was spending the summer with my family and me out on our rural farm in Snohomish, Washington. We had five acres on a huge hill, most of it fenced off into a pasture for livestock like horses, sheep, and cows. When the rains came through, the hillside turned into muck and my gravel driveway became a serious hazard. My mother had managed to get her truck stuck in it pretty often, so naturally that happened when we were trying to get out one day. Seeing that catastrophe, Garth decided that he would try to squeeze his firebird out past my mom's truck before the driveway deteriorated any further. His plan was to park somewhere overnight and sleep in his car, just to make sure we would be able to leave on time for our trip in the morning. He asked me to come keep him company because, according to him, he didn't want to be a black guy sleeping in a car in the middle of BFE. Even though I could have easily stayed in the house myself, it seemed the good friend thing to do, so I agreed. We gathered up a couple of blankets, some sodas and snacks and our paintball gear, and went out to his car. He maneuvered his way past the useless husk of my mom's stranded Chevy truck. It took a bit of doing, but eventually, we got out of the driveway and rumbled on down the road. Our first thought was to keep close to home. We decided to park alongside the corner store near the bottom of the hill. We knew the owners well and spent a good chunk of our pocket cash there on comics, ice cream, and the occasional girly magazine. So we figured if we got caught camping out in the car there, they'd be pretty cool about it. Unfortunately, we initially forgot about the number of times the windows and signs of the store had been shot out. Lots of little vandals out and about at night around there. When the thought occurred to me, we decided to relocate. Stray bullets aside, the store is built next to the old foundation of one of the first one-room schools in the valley. The place was pretty spooky at night anyway. We drove around a bit before pulling into the gravel parking lot of an old roadside barn. It was around 11 p.m. The rain actually slowed down a bit, leaving that eerie, misty gloom in its wake. You probably know the scene I'm talking about. A foggy road lined with woods on either side is not the best place to be sleeping in a car. It was too quiet. The barn's peaked roof was silhouetted by a nearly full moon against an overcast, dusky sky. Just behind it, about 10 or 15 meters to our left, was a steep embankment that dropped into a deep, dark gully that absolutely exuded creepiness. Despite all that, we actually stayed there. Honestly, it was a pretty good time at first. We joked around, drank a few sodas, plowed through our snack cakes and beef jerky supply, etc. Before too long, 
sleep had begun sneaking up on us. We shrouded ourselves with the fleece blankets we brought. I checked the door locks and dismissed the fact that I could no longer see through the fogged up windows, not seeing the otherwise haunting surroundings actually made it a bit more comfortable. Sleeping in a firebird was already painful enough without the extra visuals. I wouldn't recommend it either way. I woke up a few hours later, catching the tail end of an unsettling noise coming from outside. I didn't hear enough of it to tell quite what it was, but I did hear enough to instantly have my senses alerted. It was like what I'd imagine I'd feel after hearing the howl of a predator, signaling to its companions or the crackling of something stalking in the bush behind me. The windows had cleared up, revealing the gaping black maw of the gully that lingered just past the back lot where the old barn stood. The void seemed to almost pull our car towards itself. I shook off the initial creep factor of the strange noise, resituated my blanket, and eventually dozed back off to sleep. Minutes later, I was awakened again. My ears were suddenly overwhelmed with the most horrible cacophony of noise I'd ever experienced. My primal brain activated instantly, sending my system into fight or flight mode. I looked over at Garth to find him sitting straight up in his seat, eyes wide and face as ghostly pale as his brown skin would allow. The sound in my ears was unrelenting. I asked him, Do you hear that? He nodded, or at least I think he did. And we began scrambling around the cabin of the car flinging the blankets off to double-check the locks. The sound got louder, closer, as if whatever the source was, it was clambering up the embankment below. It was absolutely awful. As I recall it, it seemed to be some twisted combination of canine barking or whining, and some other unknown yet godforsaken creature with a disturbingly exotic range of vocal abilities. It warbled, cracked, and screeched, in what was clearly a fit of pure, unadulterated madness. Of all the wild and or domesticated animal calls and sounds I had heard in all my years living in the valley, I had never heard anything approaching that. Garth fumbled with his keys while my eyes darted between the gully and the tree line. He struggled to get the key into the ignition, pushing through the fear-induced tremors in his hands. When the noises finally reached a crescendo, the Firebird's V8 engine roared to life, and the tires blew a shower of gravel behind the car as we hauled ass out of there. It was at that moment that my fears were confirmed. As we got further away from the location, the sound faded. That meant, to me, that the noise was not just in our heads, that there was something actually coming after us. We skidded down the twisted road back to my house. I knew we wouldn't be able to make it up the hill with all that mud flowing down, it wasn't worth trying and getting stuck, or even worse. At the same time, we didn't want to park somewhere out in the open either. We decided to head all the way into town and park out in front of my grandparents' bed and breakfast, where we sat wide-eyed until morning. My friends and I continued to hear those bizarre haunting noises periodically throughout the rest of the summer. We even stumbled across an abandoned campsite in the woods, not far from the barn, where this originally happened. I could tell the place was a homeless camping spot of some sort, but we never saw anyone in the woods around there before. From where it was, we would have clearly seen it from the road and all the times that we've passed through that area, if people had been there. One night, I heard a motorcycle crash that was immediately followed by the bellowing sound of these howling things, as we took to calling them. Another night, my friends told me they were chased off the field they were using to play a paintball game. They said the noise was coming toward them so they called me up on the walkie-talkies we used to use. I heard the familiar, terrifying sound again with my own ears, coming through the speaker. That was the only summer any of us heard those things. No one ever caught a glimpse of whatever they were, or even managed to identify any specific sounds among the madness. We never heard anything like that before or since. Anyway, thanks for listening Mr. X. Sincerely. Chris. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, 
r slash let's read official and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, we're not window people.